Some of you I don't know, so actually that gives me joy. Uh, and the reason why is because in some ways that's kind of the envisioning of all this. Uh, believe it or not, the story of Grace Point North, I'm going to give a little bit of my own monologue, if you don't mind, before I start preaching. It was actually 13 years ago that I was called to Philadelphia from California. And right when I landed in Philadelphia, I would tell our leaders, I said, hey, we have a church. We're going to plant it. It's going to be called Grace Point Church. We figured that over time. And then I said, we're going to plant the church up in the North Wales, Lansdale, Montgomeryville area. And that was 13 years ago. And so to think through as we walked in faith to say God would grow the ministry, God would eventually call uh, the church together and that God would call Paul even from California and to see you all now it really does bring me extreme joy all of you have a story that uh, God has brought you here uh, and of which by the way I rejoice in the fact that the Lord is doing amazing things um, it's kind of a joy and honor again now to do that before I move on I'm actually moving August 5th for those of you who know I live a crazy life my life is even crazier right now we're trying to do our cell we you know everything else and so you can pray for us as a family uh, it's a little nuts we're actually having our open house today uh, and so if you can even prayer that the house sells. That'd be awesome. Um, 13 years ago, again, my kind of couple of quick nudges to you guys. One is this. Uh, I have felt to be a father uh, to many of you all. And uh, you know, in some ways, the Catholic Church is interesting, right? They call uh, the priest fathers. I, I feel like a spiritual father to so many of you in this room. Uh, you know, walking to, through your life, I was uh, had breakfast or dinner with one of our old couples this week, and I said, I remember when you were in college and you were just like this young punk, and now you're married with two kids, etc., and things like that. And that's a lot of you guys in this room, believe it or not. When I first met you guys, you were just you know these young, immature folks. And the Lord has grown you and matured you, and, and even to the point of obviously being leaders in this church. So it gives me extreme joy. My hope and prayer is that Grace Point North wouldn't be the end, uh, but that Grace Point North would, would also go and plant churches as well, because we need others to hear about Jesus and to respond to that great call. I'm going to give you a passage. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. You don't have to, but it's uh, Philemon chapter 1, verse 4 to 7. Philemon only has one chapter. Uh, but the book of Philemon is toward the end of the New Testament. Um, all that say is this. I, I love this passage because what it does for me is it reminds me of my heart, Paul's heart in particular for the church, but it's my heart for you all this morning. It's the same passage I'm going to share with Grace Point Central next week uh, when I finish up my tour and kind of just end, and then we're off to St. Louis um, again. Uh, let me read this passage because I think it epitomizes my heart for you. Uh, here's God's word, Philemon 1, 4 to 7. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Because if I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, and I will add, and sister, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Thankful to be here, proud of many of you, and pray that God will continue uh, along in your journey. If you have your Bibles, we are going to look at the book of Hebrews. Today's sermon is entitled, Run with Joy. And just a quick fact, I actually never preached the book of Hebrews when in my 13 years here in Philadelphia. Uh, the book of Hebrews uh, you know, it was written by a barrister, Hebrews. Uh, I'm joking, but here we go. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Uh, here's, God, here's a reading of God's word. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or, faint, grow weary or faint-hearted. This is the word of the Lord, and y'all, you say? All right, uh, let's pray as we hear God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. I'm so thankful for this church, Lord, of how you have raised up not only leaders as we celebrated not too long ago, um, but Lord, even brought so many into this room, some who might be believers and some, Father, who may not be, who are still along in the journey of questioning uh, what are the claims of Jesus, what are the claims of the gospel. But yet, Lord, we pray now that today, Lord, we would hear your voice, for that is our desire. We believe, Lord, that you were not dead, but you are still alive. You still speak through the preaching of your word. So, Father, I pray that you would give us ears to listen. Help us, Lord, as the word goes forth, that you would encourage us in particular to run this race which you have given us, to run it by faith in Jesus, to run it for the sake of his glory, and that, Father, we would allow others to join this, this miraculous and beautiful race to see that Jesus would be honored and glorified. We pray this all in Jesus' name. 
Amen. I want to begin with this question, which is the question is this. That's my family, actually, before I forget. Here we go. And the family is, what is one thing in your life that perhaps you know that you should be doing, right, that you simply haven't got started doing? What are the obstacles that have kept you from that? So, for example, right now it's July 21st. It wasn't that long ago, in, in early January, where perhaps you did a quick assessment and you said, what? You know, there's something wrong in my life. I'm going to do some form of a resolution, right? Maybe that thing was, I'm going to start eating better. I'm going to start exercising. Maybe perhaps it was a spiritual discipline. I'm going to start reading my Bible more. I'm going to do quiet time. I'm going to go to church more regularly, whatever it might have been. And now here we are, July 21st, and you ask that question. And I say, you say to yourself, I know it's good for me, but you might say right now, oh man, I failed miserably. It's only half of the year, and uh, most of those things aren't there. So the question I think that we need to ask is this, what are some things that are, you know, healthy habits, things that we should be doing that we know that we're not doing. So for example, things like flossing, exercising, diet are all good things that we need to be engaged in. Uh, I read a recent article and, and the article was talking about global habits, right? And what the article was kind of presupposed and was saying this, you know, as much as you want to tackle all these habits, there are so many of them. And so he was just saying, let me just kind of do, if there was like one or two things that you could do that can impact your life significantly, what would it be? And it was fascinating, this guy's, his conclusion. His conclusion was this. He said that the most important global factor, global habit you can engage in, take a guess, drum roll, calorie counting. He said, if it or not, he says, as simple as calorie counting has probably the most significant impact on not only your physical, your mental, emotional, spiritual. And he says, this is it. And it was just fascinating to read the article. You don't have to agree with it, but at least it's one of those things. For me, just a quick FYI, I think one of those healthy global habits is actually running. And I say that because I am a strong endorser of it. In fact, on staff, when Paul, before he, Pastor Paul started this church, we used to have staff meetings. And it was pretty fascinating because like right around 2 o'clock, you know you get that lull in the day, right? So, you know, some people say at 2 o'clock, you go get that cup of coffee or, you know, you have a Red Bull or whatever it is, right, if you get that lull. I would say it to the guys, I was like, go, guys, let's go run. <laughs> like, Pastor Paul and Pastor Tom be looking at me like, yo, we're, we're, that's like the worst idea. But I would tell them, I said, yeah, when I get tired, I run, and it's like my cup of coffee. I just get extremely energized. And so here's the thing, right? It doesn't have to be running, but let me ask, I'm going to pull the room because I did it during the first service. How many of you here in this room would consider yourself runners? Raise your hand. All right. See, and again, it's interesting because why? It's like the minority of minorities. It's one of those things where we know it's good. And I'm sure a lot of you would hopefully at least say it to one extent. Some of us might have physical limitations. But most of you would say, I know it's good, but it's really hard to get started. It's really hard to get engaged in. And yet the author of Hebrews today, believe it or not, exhorts the church to run. And here's the thing, what I want to encourage us is as we look at this passage, you're hearing this and you're saying, well, I'm going to almost tune out now because running is not my thing. But again, it's the running the race of life, running the race of faith that basically says it's one of the most exhilarating things you can get into. And in some ways, all we got to do is really just get into it. So again, going to the book of Hebrews. Again, I didn't preach in the book of Hebrews, but I know a lot about it because I've studied it over the years. But that's to say, it says, what is the point or the theme of the book of Hebrews? And so some people have said that Jesus is better. It's the supremacy of Christ. And so basically, the author of Hebrews is writing to say that Jesus is greater than anything you could ever imagine. And here's the thing, kind of the quick check would be is this, is when you think about that in your own life, ask that question. Am I convinced today, as I sit in this room and this morning, am I convinced that Jesus, to know him and to trust him, to love and worship him, is greater than anything else in this world that the world could ever afford? And I will encourage you to say this. If you do not come to that conclusion, I question and I would ask you and encourage you to wrestle through the claims of Scripture. The author of Hebrews is unknown. I might mention that many a times in this, but all that to say is this commentators, scholars have all looked through the book and said, you know what? We think it's this, but it might be this. And no one has come to a definitive conclusion. I've studied it at one point, and my wife would argue with me. I thought it was the Apostle Paul because it sounds so much like his language, but others have debated that. So the author is simply unknown. What we do know about the book is this. The book is a letter that's written in particular to Hellenistic Jews who came, became converts, who were immature, and who in particular were facing massive persecution. And so literally on behalf of their faith, they were about to be persecuted. Now let me say this because I've said this a number of times to all of you, and I'll say this to you again. I think what's missing in the church in the United States today is this. To really bring us on passion for Jesus, 
is simply that we do not have persecution. Now, I don't wish that upon any of you, but I do think it has done wonders for the church historically to say that we've actually wrestled through what it means to say, I believe in the Lord Jesus. And I actually understand what it means to put my faith in him. The last thing that we will say about the audience is this. The author of Hebrews is writing to an audience that's about to give up on their faith. It's called apostate. Which is to say, you know what? I've entered into this race, but man, I'm about to give up. Is it worth following him still? And the reason why I wanted to encourage you, and, and you know, as I was, I asked Pastor Paul and actually Grace Point uh, Central uh, whether I could speak before I leave. Uh, if I thought of an audience or, or a message for you all, is to simply say, is this at Grace Point North, when you're just beginning, I want you to realize again, A, I want you to enter into this great race, which is thrilling because I lived it about what it means to be a church plant, but also just to stay and to finish this race well for the sake of Christ. I want to remind you that in Hebrews chapter 12, some of you guys will know the book of Hebrews, uh, that in Hebrews chapter 11, it's called the Great Hall of Faith. And so for those of you who are sports folks, uh, think about the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Faith are great legends of faith who lived their life in things that were unseen. And basically as such, the author of Hebrews cites and says, by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, and all these different people, the legends who lived their life by faith. But one thing I don't think we oftentimes read is if you look at the latter part of that chapter, and then it will go into chapter 12, we read that the author of Hebrews cites and says, look at these other folks who live their life by faith. So if you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to 40, I'm just going to read this. And, and by now, you already know this. I talk fast, so I'm going to read fast. But Hebrews 11, 32 to 40, hear now this reading of God's word that reminds you, well, what does it mean to live by faith? And it says this, and what more shall I say? For time would fail, fail, fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms and forged justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lies, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, were put foreign armies to fight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Now again, those are all positive things. We think, yes, that's what it means to believe by faith. But let me continue. Some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should be made perfect. If you get what the author of Hebrews cites, he says this. He says, look, there's all the good things that we can say, but realize again, faith can even lead to things like destitute, persecution, even death. And yet it's the same gospel. It's the same good news to the, which the Bible is speaking to us. And so here's the thing, brothers and sisters, if I can encourage you today, what we're wanting to do is what the author of Hebrews is doing is say, look, there's an invitation to the race. And some of you will know this. Your life feels like a race. I have three kids. My oldest just graduated. He's going to Temple University. We're trying to sell this house, yada, yada, yada. Life just feels like a race. Everything just keeps floating around. When it comes down to our Christian faith as well, we get this as well, right? We get this idea that we're called to run. And it doesn't matter how fast you are. We simply just need to run. A couple of years ago, for the first time, I got to read Bro I run Broad Street, which is actually the longest run I've ever done. Um, and I actually wanted to run to prepare for the sermon, but it was just way too hot this weekend. I got to just tell you that. Uh, but all I have to say is this, right? Every runner will tell you that if you ever run a race, the key is this. It's just one foot in front of the other. That's it. Just one step at a time. That's all you need to do. And if I could exhort you, what I loved about being at Broad Street was there was this invitation for everyone. When I ran it, and I was, I was a decent pace. I ran an eight-minute pace the entire time. But all that to say is, is I was really fascinated when I was running because as I looked around, there were people that were older and younger than me, like literally like 10-year-old kids that were running faster than me, but that's okay, right? There were literally like grandfathers who were running faster, faster than me. People of different shapes and sizes, obviously different skin and ethnicity, all these different things. But what was beautiful about this is we were just all in the race. And there was a sense of joy that as we went through it all, right, even when we got to the finish line, we just got to celebrate each other. 
And what I loved about running that race was I felt like, man, what if the church did that in the sense of our understanding what it means to live by faith? That we all feel like we're out there on the track and we're just simply saying, hey, it doesn't matter. We're just in it together. Let's encourage each other along the way. Let's just be faithful to it. And guess what? Let's get to that finish line because together we can do this all for the sake of Christ. So what are the three things in particular that the Bible exhorts you? If you haven't thought through your life or in particular faith as a race, and the three things I want to encourage you to see are these things. First, we need to start the race. And then we need to stay in the race. And lastly, we need to finish the race. Again, starting, staying, and finishing the race. Let's begin by starting. Some of the times the hardest part is actually just to start. Right? We already know the minority now because there's probably only about four of you that raised your hand to say that you run. So the majority of you would say, well, maybe one application would be is actually to start running. Well, I'm not saying that, although by all means I can endorse that. But here's the thing, right? The hardest thing is sometimes just to start. And I almost feel like the Bible here presupposes that. It's like he knows. He's like, even in the time that this was written, which is probably, by the way, mid to late first century, the author is saying, you know what? I get it. No one really wants to get started running. Everyone hates it, but here's how you're going to start to prepare. Notice what it says. And by the way, I will say it just in terms of proper preparing. Preparing to run the race is really difficult, but yet it actually has great rewards. So for example, I just painted some rooms, right, in our house in order to prepare to sell. And the reality is, is if you just do a little bit of preparation, it makes the painting a lot easier. If you do a little bit of preparation for running, believe it or not, it makes it a lot easier. So the author is presupposing and says this, how do you prepare to run? How do you get out there, right? And 1 Corinthians 9, 2 Timothy 4, these are actually the Apostle Paul's language. He says that we would run to get the prize and running the good race. And here's two things that are found in particular in verses 1 and 2. The, the Bible says this. Is first is that we should lay aside every weight. And secondly is that we should set aside, that set aside the sin which clings to us. And let me kind of highlight each one of these. The first is this, is to lay aside every weight. Now imagine for a second, for those of you guys who go to the gym, there's like these big 45 pound dart, um, d- uh, barbells, right? That you put on the weights. Imagine if you put one of those around your neck and then I said, hey, go run a mile. Most of you would be like, nah, no, thank you. I'd rather take the weight off. It's a lot easier to run without the weight. You know, that's exactly what the Bible is saying in regards to our faith as well. So some of you will say, you know, pastor, I get it. Okay, I'm supposed to run this race of faith. It's supposed to be me getting out there. And so again, even in the time in which this was written, Olympic trainers would do what? When they would train, they would put weights on because they made it harder and more difficult. But when the actual race came, they would take those off. Why? So that they could actually run faster and they could actually run the way that they were intended to run. Here's the author is saying the same thing. If you're to enter into the race, one of the simplest things you can do is to say, you know what? What weight are you carrying around that you simply need to just set aside. It almost as though he elaborates in the second part of that. So let me just kind of go into the next point. This, the author writes and says, do you set aside the sin which so easily clings to you? So some of us in that same way, what is that weight? Well, that weight can things that, again, that we simply have depended upon. It's the dead weight oftentimes of the sin that so easily entangles you. And some of the times when it comes down to running the race, church, if I could exhort you, what we don't do a deep dive with enough is to ask this question. What are the prevailing sins of my life that for some reason, when I think about running and think again about running in this type of heat right now, I'd rather run with a 45 pound weight on my neck instead of simply just laying that aside and running the race in which God intended me to do. What are you holding on to? And here's the thing, church. All of us have something, do we not? As much as we want to point fingers and be like, oh yeah, I see that person's weight. Never do that because scripture always says, be more introspective than extrospective, right? What's the sin that has so easily prevailed within your own heart that prevents you from running the way God has intended you to? And here's the thing, right? Some of you might even say to me as your, as your guest speaker, Pastor, I feel like I'm in a spiritual rut. Things feel like I'm not kind of, you know, things aren't as intimate anymore. When I come into worship, I don't feel the nearness of God. I pray, I don't feel like he's hearing me or like there's a deep sense of fellowship and communion. When I read scripture, I don't feel like I hear his voice. I don't sense his presence, whatever it might be. When I serve, I don't have a sense of joy, et cetera, et cetera. 
all these things that we can do as spiritual indicators to be able to say, we feel like we're in a spiritual rut. Well, maybe perhaps you can just simply look at scripture here to say, hey, you know what? Maybe there's some sins that I've yet to even take a deep dive of repenting of. And I just simply need to lay it aside. I will say this is providential on this morning when I'm going to drive up. I was listening to Caleb, and so it just happened to be so where an illustration came on the radio, so I'm going to just use it. So a woman was basically apparently driving around for some reason. Her car couldn't go past 40 miles per an hour. And she's like, what's going on? What's going on? So she took it to a mechanic. The mechanic opened up the hood and looked inside, didn't see anything wrong, but eventually opened up the air filter. And inside the air filter, what happened was a squirrel had got it in and basically put all the acorns in there, right? And so basically all the mechanic needed to do was simply open up the air filter, let out the acorns, and the car could drive again. And again, I think the reason why it's a great analogy is why. Because some of the reasons will say the same thing. Well, why are you not driving the way you are supposed to drive? Why are you not running the way you're supposed to be running? Why are you not starting the race? Maybe because you're just so bogged down, not wanting to get up and say, I can put one foot in front of the other, that you're saying, you know, I'm just going to get rid of these acorns. So perhaps today you can actually do that and believe that the Lord, who is gracious, not to be scared of the fact that you would say, oh, but if I bring these acorns, will he forgive me? But that God's grace and his love abounds so that we can indeed bring our acorns, all the dead weights, and he's taken it upon himself. I love how John Owen says this. He says, you either be killing sin or sin be killing you. Again, let me say it again, be killing sin, or sin be killing you. Secondly, we want to stay in the race. How to stay in the race when it looks like others perhaps are better, some are not running. This idea that running oftentimes is a social sport. So if you look at Hebrews chapter 12, 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, almost the author is presupposing this idea that we are, in fact, social beings. Now, he's actually looking to Hebrews 11, all those who were enlisted by faith. But think about it in this way, right? Think about like Peloton and all these new gyms, right? So uh, for those of you guys who belong to LA Fitness, because I know a lot of you do, right? LA Fitness is now kind of almost like an archaic gym model, right? And here's why, because all the newer gyms are doing kind of these social things. I kind of follow these different like trends, right? And the social things are like Peloton, where basically it's like you can compete against friends and people that are in your type of skill set. And there's this idea of motivation. When you think about running, it's the same thing, right? If someone's too fast, you're like, oh. I don't even want to run. They're too fast. And you think about others who are not even in the race. Why would I want to run? Why would I want to run? They're not even getting up, right? And so we know that we're social beings because it motivates us. That's where all the new gyms are going to have kind of this idea of like, you know, you have a key, a code, and you're going to see how others are performing and tracking and that idea of motivation. And the question that I think that almost scripture slash the Bible here is encouraging us to do is to say this. How do you endure when in particular it becomes difficult? Now, again, if you're a runner, you'll know this to be true. There's always a point in time in any race in which you feel like you want to give up. Now, I've never ran Boston Marathon because I have never run a marathon. But I hear that in particular Suicide Hill, which is this incline right before Boston University, is on Commonwealth Avenue. It's this crazy, ridiculous thing where that's basically where all the runners in Boston Marathon give up because it's about halfway through. It's on this sharp incline. And people are saying, I don't have anything left to muster it up to get through this race. For those of you guys who did college or graduate school, you probably took a, what we call a weeder class in which whatever class that was to say, am I committed to this? Am I really going to kind of put my all in to be able to say, I'm going to finish this thing? And it's the same thing true of the life of faith. There will be times individually where you might say to yourself, hey, I just want to give up. This Jesus thing, I don't know if it's worth putting my faith in. The life of a church plant, I will say this because I know firsthand, the life of a church plant, people will say, I, I kind of want to just give up. There's a church down the street. It has a nicer building. It has all the programs. I don't have to put signs up. I don't have to serve. I can kind of just come and do my own thing. When it comes down to the planter, like Pastor Paul, and he may have already asked this question, but maybe he hasn't yet, but there'll be a time, which I will say that I did as well during my 12 years at Grace Point, that you just want to give up. And I can encourage you as a congregation, would you be there for him to encourage him to say, Pastor Paul, we don't want you to give up. We want you to stay in this race. We want you to endure. 
And here's the thing, church, if I can encourage you again, both personally as well as corporately, there will be a time just like, for example, the author of Hebrews is writing to whom? Young, immature, Hellenistic Christians who are on the verge of persecution, who are about to say, I want to give up. And he's saying, no, I want you so badly to stay in the race. Look in particular at your Bibles. And this is what it says in particular in verses 1 and 2. Let us run with endurance. Let's endure the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You see what the author of Hebrews is getting at. He's saying this, look at the prize in mind. Jesus is there. If we get Jesus, we get that he's greater than anything. Personally, again, this is what we would realize. What we get to endure, and the reason why we endure is because we look to Jesus. We look to him who endured everything. In the midst of the flogging, in the midst of all the things in which he went, all the way faithfully to the cross, who for the joy set before him endured all these things. Why? So that you too might endure, so that you would not quit. And this is God's grace, and I will say this. In the midst of the time of my time here in Philadelphia, there were plenty of time which I could have easily said, you know what? Peace out. Paul knows this. I've had many have offered to leave elsewhere. But all that to say is this, to be committed to endure Why? Because the prize is beautiful. It's Jesus. Jesus gets honored. Jesus gets glorified. Jesus gets to see something like this as you look around. A church that has come together to proclaim the gospel until he returns. The last part I want to just encourage you with is finishing the race. Now, here's the thing. Believe it or not, you know, most don't finish well. Even running a race. Again, all the training that you could do for a marathon, most people don't finish the race. Uh, what's crazy is you think about seminaries, right? And since I'm going to teach at a seminary, um, what's fascinating is they say one out of 10 graduates of a seminary will actually finish faithfully as a minister of the gospel in some way, shape, or form. All this money wasted, they won't end up as a pastor or as a minister of the gospel. Christians will oftentimes not finish well. We see ministers plagued with immoral scandal after moral scandal. My hope and my prayer for myself is just simply at the end of the day, and you could pray for me in regards to the ministry I'll be doing as a professor, is just simply to say, you know what, Lord, I just want to hear the voice of you that says, well done, my good and faithful servant. So here's the question that I want to ask as we end, which is this, how can we know that we can finish? Again, there's that point in which we all want to give up. And here's where the author of Hebrews draws to. He says this, here's how you know you can finish it. You get the prize. It says, look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And why? Because guess what? He becomes the substitute runner for you. Imagine for a second in that place, in Suicide Hill, you're getting to that point, you're like, I just want to give up. It's imagine for a second, right? You say, well, there's almost like a guy. He just comes in off scene. And he says, you know what? I'm going to take your place. I'm going to run the rest of the race for you. And even though as hard as it is, I'm going to endure it. I'm going to get through it. I'm going to cross that finish line. And I'm going to declare that what I've done for myself is actually for you. My victory is your victory. I've told you this illustration before, but some of you guys will know. There's so many gospel implications to it. You know the word marathon, which at some point, again, I want to do. The word marathon is fascinating because why? It comes from a, a, a story, right? And basically, it's 490 BC. That, uh, there was a great victory, which uh, the, the Greek had won. And basically, uh, a Greek uh, celebrating the victory the, over the Persians, right? And so this guy had to run from Marathon, Georgia, or Marathon, Greece, all the way over to Athens to declare the victory over the Persians. It was 25 miles, 26.2, if you want to do the math. And all that to say is this, when he got there, he basically wasn't in the greatest shape, but he says to everyone, Nikki, which means we won, and then he falls over and he dies, right? And by the way, all that to say is that's why only crazy people want to do marathons. But here's the thing. The beauty is what? He finished, he declared victory, and he says, it's over. And you know what the hope of every believer, the hope of this church is? Why do we know we finish well? Because we look to Jesus, who was our substitute runner, who ran for us. All the way to Calvary, who laid himself before everyone. What did he cry on the cross? It is finished. And here, church, is where I know our hope is. Our hope is not in our numbers, our budget, or anything else. Our hope is in Jesus. 
who finished the race on our behalf. Would you set your eyes not to the left and not to the right, but simply upon Jesus? And so if I can encourage as we wrap up here, is if you're a Christian, would you just look to Jesus and to Jesus only? That's exactly what the book of Hebrews is getting at. Jesus is far greater than anything else. Look to him who endured, who grants you this victory that you would run faithfully. As a church, would you have hope in this confidence, the promises of scripture that again, Jesus is building his church and that even the gates of Hades will not be able to prevail against it. That you look to confidence to be able to say, you know what, we can do this together. We can all run this race together. We can all cross that finish line and hear the words of our Savior to say, as he endured, as he felt the pleasure of God running across that finish line, we too get to finish well for the sake of him. Lastly, some of you guys may not know this uh, movie or story. Uh, just I'm going to uh, pull the room again. How many of you know or have watched the movie Chariots of Fire? Raise your hand. All right, again, a minority of minorities. At the first service, it was just one person. But all that to say is this, right? So the story of Chariots of Fire, actually, the movie itself was made in 1981. Uh, it's a story that documents a, story of, uh, a man named Eric Little, who was a Scottish Olympic medalist runner. And Eric Little, I forgot what race he ran, but long story short, he ran a race in which he qualified in which he was supposed to run for the gold medal. Long story short, the race was scheduled to be on a Sunday. And Eric Little, because he was a devout Christian, was set to be a missionary to China, in fact, was born in China as a, as a missionary kid, wanted to go back to China. Basically, he says, I cannot run on Sunday. Absolutely not. So you literally have the prime minister and people say, what? Are you crazy? You're not going to run the race of your life to win the gold medal? He's like, no. My conviction is, is what my conviction is. And again, I want to just kind of tease that out really quick. I do think we need to recapture that heart today because I think it is completely lost in the church today. Let me move forward, though, with the point. Eric Little, though, at some point, he begins to explain. He says, why do I run? He wants to be a missionary, but yet he says to himself, he said, man, I run because why? Because God made me with a purpose. And when I run, I sense the Lord's pleasure. He goes forward, just as an FYI, just like another part of the story. He eventually runs a different race, and he actually still wins the gold, which is fascinating. But here is a devout man. I just want to end by just watching this quick one-minute video. As we end, just hear his words that talks about sensing the pleasure of God. And if I can encourage you, again, both individually and corporately, may this be the, uh, the word of the Lord for you this day, that you would run faithfully. I can't wait to hear stories as I'm in St. Louis about how God is blessing the church, how God is growing the church, not numerically, but growing you all to be faithful followers of Christ who run for him. Watch this. I've decided. I'm going back to China. The missionary service have accepted me. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm so pleased. <laughs> so I've got a lot of running to do first. Jenny, Jenny, you've got to understand. I believe that God made me for a purpose, for China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To get it up would be to hold him in contempt. You were right. It's not just fun. To win is to honor him. Jenny. Jenny. That's the end of the video. He just says Jane. He likes Jane. But I want to highlight just the words. To give up would be to hold God in contempt. Don't give up. Run the race well. Run not again because running is fun, because it's not for most of you but you run because you honor him, you glorify him. May Jesus be glorified in your life and the life of this church. Let's pray together. Father, I do thank you. I rejoice, Lord, in just what you're doing here in this church. Lord, how you, again, are still alive. And Lord, you, you grew, you're the one, Father, who made this church into existence. Your word tells us, Lord, that you knew us before the foundations of the world. So you knew all the hearts in this room of who, Father, you are calling into the midst of this family.
and those, Father, who are not even here, who will one day be here, because, Lord, that's what you do. You still call men, women, and children to yourself to the saving knowledge of Jesus. So, Lord, I do pray, Lord, that you would cause this church, Lord, to not only enter into the great race of faith, but, Lord, that they would endure. They would endure when times are good, but, Lord, they would also endure when times are bad. Father, be with Pastor Paul. Be, Father, with elders Dave and Dave, Lord, as they govern and shepherd this church and the other future leaders of this church, that they would run in such a way that they would endure, in such a way, Lord, that they would finish well, whether it be through your return or, Father, will it be again till you call us home to glory? Lord, these things we pray that you might bless us, that you might, Father, keep this church. And, Father, I do pray that you would encourage all of us here in this room that, again, you would beckon us by faith to do it in such a way that we do it to honor you. Jesus, be honored and glorified in our life and the life of this church. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, the response song. Uh...